Good morning, everyone. I'm Rajkumar. I'm going to take you through the K-means clustering. So just a brief about me before we get into this. I've been in this industry, in the software industry, doing various kinds of STLGC activities and currently leading the analytics team in one of the MNCs. And I have been working on both big data as well as data science. And currently I'm dealing with both big data and data science. I have been on this field of big data and data science for past six years. So this is a brief about me. Let's get into the session today. What do we learn today? So we will learn introduction to machine learning. We'll learn cluster analysis, types of clustering, introduction to k-means clustering, how k-means clustering works, and a demo on R uh, using a Netflix use case. So there could be lots of doubts are waiting for information on the machine learning. So what is machine learning? How it is uh, different from big data? And uh, how it is different from the rest of the other programming things? So, so machine learning is something where we are trying to learn from the existing data, which is not something like a summarization, sum of something, count of something, count of some of the attributes, a summary of some of the attributes. Is that primarily, so it basically starts with things like when we do linear regression using Excel, that's one of the tools which can do that. So we are trying to take entire data sets and then trying to figure out what will be a common equation, either being a linear or a quadratic or exponential or whatever it is. So we try to understand how the entire data set behaves and how close they are to the model we are coming up. And then we have an option if we provide with new attributes, new sets of data, it will be able to predict how, where it will exactly fit. So this is what machine learning at a very, very high level is. So for example, one of the best examples is that, so we have these Gmails and Yahoo. So one of the biggest challenges is that they have to isolate the spams from the normal non-spam mails, right? The mails which are actually targeted against you from the actual people instead of the spammers has to land your inbox and the rest of the things has to get out of the inbox and then stay in a spam folder. So what happens is, what happens initially they categorize the spams and the hams, whatever is non-spam is called hams, so they categorize that and then they feed into these machine learning algorithms and then they try to figure out whether the model fits in. So they go ahead on regression on this to see how close we can achieve and then they implement the system. It becomes a kind of filter before the mails comes to you. So what happens in this case, as and when the new mails or the new spams come in, they do an analysis on top of it and then the system automatically adjusts and then tries to filter it more efficiently. So this is one of the classic examples. We are going to see much more examples in this session. Computers with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. In a programming world, you exactly say what will be the input and what should be the output. That's where it stays. But in a machine learning, as and when the data comes, the system adjusts itself to the reality and then it behaves accordingly. So that is how the dynamic nature of machine learning are the artificial intelligences. So in order to get into this, so what do we do? This is the highest level of how the system works. So we get the training data. So when we say we get the training data, so in an initial stage, every data is like a training data for us. So what do we do? Say if you have 1,000 samples. So you traditionally we split it into 60, 40, 70, 30, or 80, 20. So 60% of the data or 70% of the data using a sampling method has been picked up because we cannot take the initial 60% because that will skew the entire model. So we take the sample of 60%, randomly sample them, take the data, and then we keep it for training the model. And then we keep the rest of the 40% as test, which means, so for the test data, we already have a target attribute, right? We know the outcome. So once the model, once we create the model with the training data, so that's your learn algorithm side. We feed this data into the learning algorithm, and then we get the output, we get the model. So in the model, what do we do? That's the third stage, which is building your model. Then what you do, you take the training data, remove the target attribute, 
and then pass it into the model. So this will give you an output. So now you compare the output which is a predicted output with the actual output. Now you get the inference. You provide the feedback into the learning algorithm so that which means you tweak the algorithm based on your inference and then you again build the model so that you try to achieve a better frequency. And k-means is one of the classic examples where this iterative process is explicitly visible. So moving on. So ML use case which is a machine learning use case for Google self-driving car. What happens with the Google self-driving car? Google self-driving car is smart and it's driverless. Currently you need to have a person sitting there only for emergency conditions but the rest of the things is being done by the Google driving car. So what happens? It has the cameras, you can see that it has the cameras at the top and then so using the cameras it picks up the environment so that's what it does. It picks the environment in its totality through the sensors. It has other sensors too. It takes the decision like when to speed up, when to speed down, when to overtake and when to turn. So it's like not only the camera, you have the other sensors also. You will have their Google Maps attached because it needs to have starting place and the final destination. So it has something on its artificial intelligence where it knows from where to where it has to travel. It also gets feedback from the other mechanism on which of the roads are crowded and which of the roads are less crowded. So it exactly knows the direction and the roads which it has to travel. So what information it needs dynamically? The dynamic information is how is the road ahead? The sensors checks for the road ahead computes those information to decide whether how much of space or how much of distance is free right now so that whether it has to increase its speeds or if it is completely crowded and it has to reduce its speeds and or if it has to take a braking decision or it has to take a turning decision. So coming to the types of machine learning, there are two types of machine learning. It's like supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So what happens in a supervised learning? You feed the classifier with the training set and the predefined labels. That's what we have been discussing right now. So you know from the data set which is being fed to the model, you know what are the attributes and what is the target variable. So you know what is the outcome. So you feed that separately, right? These are my attributes and this is what I expect out of it. So it will learn, categorize the particular data under a specific model. It does its algorithm to figure out how the particular target variable has been achieved based on the input variables, right? So in this example, right, you can see when and where should I buy a house, right? So the features are, so buying a house, am I going to buy a house here? Am I going to buy a house in North America, West Europe, Eastern Europe? Those becomes buying a house in these locations becomes your decision point, right? Buying or not buying is your decision. And what are the things which actually makes your decision or which helps your decision? The house features, the area crime rate, the bedrooms, distance to headquarters, areas in square feet and the locality. Okay, so you can see that this consists of variables. So those are the things which comes into the picture. There are there can be numerical variables and there can be categorical variables. So things like distance to headquarters, areas in square feet are all numerical. So the area crime rate, the house features, the locality can be categorical or if you can, unless otherwise you are able to convert them into numerical. So which means we already deal with both categorical as well as numerical variables, right? So based on these, when you feed the entire data with these attributes and someone who has already bought houses in that location, so that system starts learning. If something is bought in this location, these are the features. So that is how the system builds itself. The model gets created. So if you go for the unsupervised learning, this is the case where you don't know what is happening there. So there is no outcome on this. For example, people getting into the mall and then buying certain items, right? So we don't have an attribute to say that this person will buy these attributes at the first shot. So what happens? We try to understand who are the customers who bought what. 
right? Then we try to classify them, then we try to cluster them, and then finally we try to use this as a predictive methodology for the rest of the users. So for example, here an image of roots is first fed into the system. Right. So the system identifies different fruits using features like color, size, and it categorizes them. Right. So when a new fruit is shown, it analyzes its features and puts it into a category having a similar feature type. So this is one of the kinds of classing. Initially, you start with something where you don't have a target variable, right? And then you cluster them, you figure out a model, and then when a new fruit comes or when a new attribute comes into the system you classify into one of those things which is already there. So this is the basic difference between the supervised learning and an unsupervised learning. So if there are any questions, kindly message me on this chat and then I'll try to respond as and when I see that. This is pretty much about the brief about what machine learning is and what types of machine learning algorithms or what types of machine learning are there, primarily the supervised and the unsupervised learning. Well, let's move ahead into cluster analysis. So what is clustering? So primarily clustering means grouping of objects based on the information found in the data, describing the objects or their relationships. So we have a set of data and then we try to group them, we try to classify them. Say, for example, we have people residing and there is a uh, cable connection going on. If you want to increase your chance of people subscribing for this cable connection, you better understand the demography there so that you can provide the channels, required channels to those people, target those people. Which means, right, so if there is a particular community which has particular language preference, right, if you think that this set of community has more of a Spanish people or Spanish speaking people, and this community has more of a French speaking people, and then uh, more of an English speaking people, it's better you try to understand these classifiers in order to target them better. So because you can have your set of channels completely tied to them so that those set of people can pick those, can subscribe for you, else your competitor gains a foothold there. So this is one of the reasons we go for something like a clustering. So the goal is that the objects in one group should be similar to each other. We'll talk about this more as we get into the algorithm. So understand this, this will be com converted into mathematics here. So the goal is that the subjects in one group should be similar to each other, but it has to be different from objects in another group. Right? We will convert this exactly into complete statistics as we get in. So that is the beauty of this machine learning algorithm. So you have to have a tight community, right? And you call them a group and there should be subsequent difference or there should be good amount of difference between the clusters, which means different groups. If it is not there, how it is, we'll also see those things, okay? So it deals with finding a structure in a collection of unlabeled data, right? So you see all the data to be same in the initial phase and then you try to find the structure of collections within them because at the first shot it's completely unlabeled. So some of the examples of clustering methods are one is k-means clustering which is what we are going to deal today in detail. Then it's fuzzy or c-means clustering you have hierarchical clustering. These are one of the samples because there is so many clustering methodologies and particularly if you are going to use a software like R, so which has 4,000 packages, right? You are bound to see lots and lots of clustering. So there is a question from Priyanka. Is clustering only for unsupervised learning? No. Here we are going to deal with the supervised learning only because we have the target variables also. So clustering can be done on both supervised as well as unsupervised. Okay, okay, different types of clustering. The different types of clustering here is like some of the samples is that k-means clustering, another is fuzzy means clustering, c-means clustering or hierarchical clustering. Apart from this, there are other sets of clustering also. So these are one of the samples. So what we are going to deal with is k-means clustering. In order to explain for Nachiket, I'm just going back. So what is critical in this k-means clustering or any type of clustering is that the goal of the objects in one group should be similar to each other. The objects within the group should look similar and the object in one group should be significantly different from other groups. That's the crux of this clustering. 
So that's the main main thing about the clustering. Moving ahead, so we are coming to the clustering use cases. Some these are some of the examples. It's being used in marketing widely. Okay, we will also see this uh, as examples, detailed examples. So here, discovering distinct groups in customer databases, such as customers who make a lot of long distance calls, who are mostly on short distance calls, who are mostly on texting. So WhatsApp has slightly changed these things, right? This is some of the things which we deal before the impact of WhatsApp. WhatsApp has uh, slightly altered these things. Uh, it's differently, but still we do lots of, particularly for long distance calls and for the other things like ISDN and the broadband and all the other things. So discovering a distinct group of customer bases so that you can target with your features for those customers so that they have a very high hit rate of subscribing to your services is one of the clear use cases. So in the insurance industry, so identifying groups of crop insurance policy holders with high average claim rate right so so it's like things like you identify when it becomes profitable when they make losses and then is there a specific group which is dependent on the insurance claims which means right so what are the other side effects of this you try to increase premiums for those who has high average claims and then you try to offer soups for those who has less average claims we know about the insurance in the auto sector right these are some of the things where they have to target for the premiums and also it's one of the front-loaded stuff which means not like your fixed deposits or other things where here the premium comes up front and one leave and there is a loss or something you go back and provide the claims and the percentage of claims should also remain less so that uh, the insurance company is not affected so it's highly critical that we go the insurance industry understands the type of customers to whom they are pitching for the uh, particular insurance policy next it's land use so identification of areas are similar in land use in a GIS database. So this can be done for multiple purposes, right? So the land use primarily if you're going, if you're trying to create land banks and then you're trying to provide a particular set of industries and the things like cases where there are 2,000 of acres identified only for uh, bringing in industries and then a specific type of industry so it becomes a cluster there so for all those things and uh, so it also depends upon what kind of industry is that what do they do is it simply they use the land or they pump in something into the land or they extract something out of the land and based on that the water source should be nearby should the water source be far away or if there is anything which is toxic which has to be taken care of for all those things identifying the land areas becomes critical so now even in India we have cartographic satellites right which actually tries to find the minerals below the surface uh, at a certain distance so uh, once they identify they decide what kind of operations can be performed on the land use so all these things machine learning is playing a vital role in identifying all those things similarly six mix studies right so identifying probable areas of oil and gas explorations based on the seismic data right similarly it's not only for oil and gas exploration so they use it for identifying shale oils right and uh, primarily try to see the crust below which where the shale oil is available and it's also helpful in identifying the seismic zones um, so that proper guidelines are given for building of structures in those zones so machine learning is being used in all these areas okay getting into types of clustering there is exclusive clustering, there is overlapping clustering and hierarchical clustering. So I think uh, the examples here, the pictures here is kind of self-explanatory, but getting into the details, right? So we go for exclusive clustering, so we are able to identify exclusive clusters when the items belongs exclusively to one cluster and not several right came is just the sort of exclusive clustering very nicely so what happens is out of the entire set of data we are exactly able to say okay these are the separate clusters right so but sometimes you may not be able to do because uh, there will be data points there are data points which lie on the border and then it overlaps between two clusters right? so item can belong to multiple clusters its degree of association with each cluster is known right so from the center 
how much is associated to the center is completely known. So fuzzy RC means does this sort of exclusive clustering. So this is where fuzzy clustering comes into the picture. The C means clustering comes into the picture. This is where we have to use if the clusters are overlapping. Hierarchical clustering, when two clusters have a parent-child relationship or a tree-like relationship. Right, so that's when you go for a hierarchical clustering, which means the clusters in itself have a parent. Right, so that's when there is a relation between the clusters, that's when you go for hierarchical clustering. Okay, coming to k-means clustering, so k-means is one of the simplest algorithms which uses unsupervised learning method to solve known clustering issues. Okay, what happens is in this k-means clustering, one of the key things is that we don't know how many clusters are there inside, right? So what do we do is we try to start with a number and then uh, we try to seed them with multiple cluster points so that the model goes ahead and splits the entire population into slow many clusters. See, to be very clear, right? So I first start with cluster of two for the entire population. It tries to split the entire population into two clusters and then it comes up. So then we try to see it with three clusters, right? Then we try to see it with four clusters. So we increase the cl number of clusters, which is the K value here. So that is how this clustering is done. We do iterative models in order to find which is the appropriate cluster or where we have the appropriate cluster, right? So that is K-means clustering. Right. Claim means clustering in terms of inputs, it needs a number of clusters and the training set. So that is what it requires. So moving ahead, right, one of the examples is that the Google News. Okay, so we can see a single topic containing multiple links from different URLs or different web pages. This is one of the classic examples of how the clustering is done. So various URLs related to Trump and Modi are grouped under one section. The K-means clustering automatically clusters news stories about the same topic into predefined clusters, right? So that's what it does. Can we do the clustering directly on this? So that may not be possible. In this particular case, it might take us more to do perform a K-means clustering because news are traditionally unstructured data. So earlier we saw in types of structure, in types of machine learning, we saw supervised and unsupervised. Now we are getting into another thing, which is like the data which is incoming, it can be either structured, primarily if you are retrieving it from a database or if you are having something like a CSV file, right? So where you know the exact number of columns and then you have a list of items which is like a record for sample and then you have a number of rows in it. So columns becomes your attributes and the rows becomes the data points for you. You can also have semi-structured data. So semi-structured data is in something where you get the outputs from the web servers because to an extent the initial portions which web server it is coming from, which web server is viewing that output, what time it was and what man, other things like if at all there are process ID or if there are anything associated with if it's a slave or a master or the IP address, the initial portion is usually kind of specified, the positions are specified or sometimes it can be like key value pass. It says time is equal to so and so, web server is equal to so and so, app server is equal to so and so. So even if the positions are changed, you will be able to extract that, right? So key value pass one can, once again can be spanning into different types. It can be document based or it can be straight key value pass based. But after that you will have a free flowing text. So what do you do there in order to convert that? You take all the things which are specified and then you take the free flowing text. But we definitely know what format it is going to be. And you have the other set of data which is completely, right, it's like unstructured data. Some of the logs can be unstructured and similarly the news items or the blocks are completely unstructured because you don't have any specific format and you cannot split them into records. So what do we do in that? 
In that case, we first apply the natural language processing or the text mining. We bring those data into n-dimensional space and using each and every vector in the n-dimensional space, you go and map for the similarity. That is when you start applying things like uh, cosine similarity, Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, Jacquardi's coefficient. So you have so many methods by which you can find, once you have converted the text into the vectors or in an n-dimensional space, you can do the distance matrix between two different types of data. And then based on that you can perform clustering. In this case it's not a single step process, it's multi-step process before we do a clear means clustering. But ultimately we do the clustering so that we can group items of similarity in this particular case, right, the news items in particular and we give the ones which has a maximum hits at the topmost and then we also list our Google list all those things which are similar and uh, from different URLs, things like you can see here like NDTV or the Independent or the Guardian. Okay, so the examples, right? So if you want to, one of the target here in this particular slide is that you want to place a school and then you want to find a specific location to build schools in this area so that the student doesn't have to travel much. So that is the target. So what do we do? We try to get the plot of location of the students from where they are traveling from the existing students data set, right? And then we plot them and then we try to find in which locations if a school is placed, that kids will be able to travel faster or they have less time to travel. So here we have to ignore certain facts like there will be parents who want to send their kids to a particular school irrespective of the distance. But the one of the main things which are trying to attack is that assuming that the students are traveling to a farther distance because they don't have a very good school nearby. You can see the expansion of the same schools who have been traditionally having one or two schools in the entire city, but now they are spreading their wings across the city. This is before they decide where to place the schools. There are other constraints to position the schools, but it should be near the very big roots and other things. In spite of all those attributes, they also look for which are the students or what kind of students can come to their school with a lesser distance. So that's one of our target attributes. So anyone who goes for these kinds of branding or the business, they will be able to look into or they will be able to take help from the clustering. From this itself, because it has been visually plotted, we can kind of understand where the school should be and what kind of centroids are there, right? You can see if we do go mathematically, we'll be able to find where the school should be positioned and how many schools are needed for the entire mass of this children. So you do multiple iterations and finally you come to your conclusion that yeah, this looks good. So now getting into the nitty gritties of how it was done, right? which means we have to get into how k-means works. So how k-means works, it's like you choose the number of clusters and definitely we are going to iterate on it, right? So the WFS is defined as the sum of the squares distance between each member of the cluster and its centroid, right? This is our good old distance matrix which we have studied in your very young classes, right? It's a summation of, it's primarily the, you calculate the variance, right? Pij minus Qij and then you square it. That's your variance. So particularly you do it for j and you do it for i. It's a square, the sum of the square distance between each member. That's what it is. How do we do it? We start with one cluster. One cluster doesn't make anything, right? So we start with two clusters and then we see what is the within sum of squares for that you get a sum within sum of squares and then you go ahead and do the prediction two, three, four, five clusters and then you find a position after which you don't want to do further clusters. Yes, the clustering with four works but the incremental benefit we get out of it is very less. So this becomes your elbow point which is three, the number of clusters which is three. You can see that P is the data point, right? And Q is the closest centroid to the data point. So those are those two variables. The idea of the album method is to choose the K after which the WSS decrease is almost constant. That means the incremental decrease in the within sum of squares, if it is almost negligible, right? That is when you stop increasing the number of clusters because the cost of increasing the clusters and taking a decision, in this case, the school, right? Should you go for, if you put this in the question of creating the number of schools, should you do two schools for the cluster, three schools for the cluster, four schools for the cluster, five schools for the cluster, right? So you see that there is a significant benefit 
significant uh, optimization in the cost when the K is 3, that is 3 schools. But if you start placing 4, 5, 6 schools, right, the cost increases ex exponentially and the benefit decreases drastically. You don't have the, that much benefit when you go for higher clusters. So that is how important the K is. So K becomes your decision point. So how do we initialize it? We randomize the initial K points called the cluster centroids because that's what we are seeing, right? Here we start with K is equal to 2 and the value of K can be determined by the elbow curve as we explained in the previous slide, right? So with 2, you try to start. So what do you do? We have to remember that the centroids are a random points right now. You compute the distance matrix for every data point. That's why PI is the data point. So you compute it for every data point and you compute it for the closest point in the center, the closest centroid for the data point, right? As you do this, right, you start with a centroid and then you keep computing it, which means the model actually does that and it achieves at a final centroid, right? So you can see that this is how the cluster assignment happens. Compute the distance between the data point and the cluster centroid. Depending upon the minimum distance, the data points are divided into two groups right now because you start with this cluster and if you compute this, this is how it will look like, right? So you can see that. So all the data points which are closer to the orange cluster are spotted here and all the data points which are closer to the blue, blue centroid are spotted here. Right. So now what happens is as you compute further, the centroid moves. The centroid moves closer and closer, which means it actually moves towards the actual centroid. Right. Compute the means for blue dots and the reposition the blue centroid, the cluster centroid to this mean. Okay. Similarly, do it for orange dots. So the migration happens iteratively within the model. As you move forward, this is what has happened. As you move the repeat previous two steps iteratively till the cluster centroids start changing their position. At some point, the centroid doesn't change for further computations. That is when the model converges. So the model has converged for these two clusters and these are your boundaries. Okay, so this is one of the things. There are other models, things like support vector machines, which actually tries to increase the distance between these two things, right? So it finds the support vectors where there is maximum distance between the clusters. So there are models to do that. So let me take a couple of questions here. So Nachiket Prabhakar is asking, how should I initialize the, the centroids? So Prabhakar, this is, this is what I said. You start with the random points. So you don't worry about where I have to position my clusters. As and when it does iteratively, as I was uh, showing here, right? So you can see that it starts at any random location. So particularly in this example, right, they have taken diagonally opposite positions where we are not biased towards the cluster, right? You can see that though these two things are the cluster visually for us, the computer doesn't know about it. So they have picked up the points which is completely tangential to it, right? And the cluster automatically with the iterations while computing the new centroids, it will automatically move to the appropriate position. So to answer your question, it's a simple random selection. Okay, Priyanka has a question. How are further new centroids found in further optimization? What's the formula behind that? And Prabhakar has a question. Can I choose the centroids at different positions? So particularly in this k-means model, right? You can see that we are not choosing the initial random positions. So let me go back. Okay, so the k-means, if you see here, right, the k-means clustering requires only these two things. You have to tell it what is the number of the clusters, right, and you have to give the training set item. These are the only things, only to see that if you are going to choose the points, right, then you are going to bias the decisions. So the model should not be biased by any decisions if it has to perform in any situation. Right, that's the key part of machine learning. If you're going to bias it, so it's like a garbage in, garbage out. So if you're providing a garbage in, what you get is a garbage out, right? Machine learning is not for taking decision. Machine learning is primarily for understanding. So if you are chosen to give, and the other thing, a strength the model should have is if you're biasing it, it should be able to come out of it and then 
provide the same kind of output which is unbiased right so that's the case as you can see k means doesn't have any means to take the initial random points it picks its own random points that's the crux you only tell how many clusters you want and you provide the training set so you don't have an option to do that i hope i answered both priyanka's as nachiket's um, uh, questions shoot me a message if you think that i haven't answered you so this is primarily random points it can be picked up from anywhere but the model has to be robust enough to find its centroid because on multiple iterations irrespective of you if at all there is a provision for you to give an input point right it should converge at a place where it has supposed to converge okay so the random points become important when your model is not capable of finding global maximums or global minimas Priyanka has after initial random centroids how are the new centroids formed okay that's within the model the centroids are formed by the model and it iterates and then it moves the centroid so you don't deal with the centroid at all because you don't give the initial centroid the initial centroid is picked by it randomly and then it computes the distances and once it computes the distances because you have given k which is you are saying that it has to be two clusters so from the two clusters right it forms two clusters in this case you can see that so it forms two clusters so for these clusters initially it was like this so there is no particular thing so you just pick off so you calculate each and every distance matrix here but once you have calculated you know that these are the points which are closer to this and these are the points you closer to it so you find the centroid for this data set right and then you move your current centroid whichever we are using to as the centroid for this data set so the centroid for this data set varies from this position right similarly the centroid for this data set varies from this position and that is when your centroids move here so now you do the computations again so what happens in certain cases right so these points will come within the centroid earlier it was orange now on the second or third iteration these points can become blue similarly these points can become orange right so that's how the entire cluster changes over the iterations so once you find the next set of things which are closer then you compute the centroid again so it moves again closer to the actual right to what it has to be similarly this moves again closer to what it has to be so that is when these points and the third or fourth or fifth iteration what happens these things start becoming orange because your centroid has moved in the northeastern direction or the eastern direction right this moves in the western direction so as and when this moves in the western direction you get more points which are closer so you recompute the centroid so that's the crux the threshold will be there internally within the model so if the movement of the centroid does in exceed there that's when you say it has converged okay thank you priyanka okay so this is your optimization and the final step is the convergence right so finally the k means clustering algorithm converges right which means it divides the data points into two clusters clearly visible in orange and blue right so this is how the convergence happens and then the model stops so nachiket is asking does the clusters formed depend on where the centroids are initialized no right it should not be that is that should be the strength of the model because nothing should be the starting point should not be a biasing case right but there are technicalities here right because if you go deeper into it right saying are we talking about the global minimums or the local minimums right so those are the questions which cannot be covered just within the k means yes so we have to jump out if we are stuck in a local minima so which means if you have to find the local min and there are models which can do it and there are models which cannot do it but for your question the initial starting points will not decide the clusters so problem statement so this is when we are going for the example so challenge is netflix wanted to increase its business by showing more popular movies on its website so once again right because the problem statement is there it becomes very easy for us to proceed but one of the biggest challenges in this industry which is the data science industry is defining the problem itself is a big problem right so arriving at what do i want and what kind of models i have to go after is in itself a science here okay thanks sachin so solution so 
Netflix decided to group the movies based on the budget, gross and Facebook's, which means from the whole set of data available, you have already narrowed down to the attributes which I have to look into so that I can increase my target audience, right? So out of, you can see once I bring up the example, right? Out of 23 odd attributes, we have narrowed down to two. So, but how do we do this? That in itself is another part of data science here. So you do something like one of the things which I was saying is that SVM, there are things like principal component analysis where you analyze which attribute significantly increases my or increases or decreases my target variable, right? There are other data science models, so we are not going there, but somehow we have figured out from the entire list of attributes, we have chosen budgets and gross. So these are the two attributes which are picking and so that we can go for a grouping. So approaches for this, Netflix took INDB data set, right, which is available. It has taken a 5,000 values. It applied k-means clustering to the group. So the target is I want to find the groups and from the groups I want to find which is the best possible group, right? That will be my target. So this is how the script looks like. Uh, I'll just run this, right? We take the movie data set, right? Uh, we find the dimensions of it. We convert that into a matrix, right? We omit the things where there are values. There are no values. We get just 500 samples out of it. And then we pick the columns. This is your gross and what is the other one? Yeah, budget and gross. So your ninth column and your 23rd column accounts for the budget and the gross. So from that, we create a data matrix. And then this is where we provide inputs. The k-means is iterated from the k-value. You can see the centers, right? Which is, it is iterated from 2 to 15, which means I'm finding within sum of squares all the way from k equal to 2 to k equal to 15. I'm finding those things. And then I'm plotting, I'm finding the elbow and then I'm deciding which should be the target group, okay? Let's go to the R coding, okay? This is the same thing which was sh shown in the presentation, right? These are the nitty-gritties of R. I'm, whatever I have, I'm removing all the values here, so whichever is your environment variable, right? And then, so I'm setting the working directory. This is my working directory. This is how simple it is to read the movie data. So you have a movie, movie metadata.csv, right? So I don't have to open it in a CSV because you can see it right now. It's as simple as to read a particular data set into the memory, right? And it's already read and you can see that just by clicking, you can see the data. And if you see here, right, it tells you what this data is, right? So it has 5,043 rows and it has 28 attributes, 28 variables is your attributes. It's like the color, the director name, the number of critic reviews, the duration, all those things. And uh, your ninth field is nothing but your gross. And you can see that your 23rd field will be your budget. So this will be the budget. So these are the two attributes we are just, I'm saying ahead. So this gives lots of information about the data set you have taken. And when you're just clicking this, you can see that it launches a command, which is movie of, which is view of movie meta data. Getting further, right, the dimensions, right? So I'm trying to see the dimensions. So it, it gives these variables here, whatever is here. It says that it consists of 5,043 rows and 28 columns. So I'm converting this into a data matrix so that uh, I can perform certain further operations, right? So I'm converting that into a data matrix and then the na.omit does it, it removes. So when we saw this, we found that there were a few NAs here, right? So this is an NA, which means for the number of critics for this particular movie, it is not available. So holes like this will create a skew and or sometimes the error will be thrown by the models. The holes cannot be there in certain models, right? Certain models are sensitive to it. Certain models are okay with very sparse metric. So in this particular case, means we cannot have that. So we are removing this row. If at all we have a row uh, with an empty column, then that, that entire row will be removed. So that's what is happening here. So now if you see the sample, right? So I have to run the sample. What did I do? Out of the 5,043 uh, rows, I have used the random sample so I'm picking only random 500 records, 
right so i have only 500 data set that's what i'm doing right now right and i'm storing it as a sample now i'm viewing the sample so which means you can see right now it is showing all the 500 entries right now so this is what we have right now and this is the data set on which we are going to operate out of those 500 i am interested in only columns two columns which is 9 and 33 which is gross and budget what I'm doing from the sample, I'm picking only those two columns. And now if I do a view, you can see that you have 500 entries, right? And uh, you have just two columns, which is gross and budget. And this is what I'm going to use for performing the model. Okay. I'm converting that sample into a data matrix because that's needed. And now I'm going ahead and computing. So you can see that I'm taking the sample variance and uh, sample metric, and then I'm applying the variance for every column. So I'm individually, this is what the apply, apply does, right? And uh, I'm computing the within sum of squares. So now I'm computing within sum of squares, right? And applying a model is the most simplest piece in the data science world. Uh, the 70 to 80% of the work goes on pre-processing, and then uh, it's primarily on how to find the data, how to pick the data of your choice, how to remove the holes. And there are other things like how do I standardize because uh, I cannot have data of varying sizes or it's like uh, varying, uh, you can call it amplitudes or for example, if I can say, right, so one data, if I can do a summary, it will show summary of sample matrix, right? If I do that, it will tell you. So, right, you can see that the minimum is 1,111 and the maximum is 43 and odd, whatever it is. But you can see for the budget, right, it starts at 30K, right, and it goes all the way up to $4 billion. So, sometimes K means is agnostic to this, so it can handle this. So, sometimes certain models we have to standardize with means. So, we will convert this either between 0 and 1, min and max will be minimum will be 0 and maximum will be 1. We can go, that is like a range, standardization using range or we can do a Z range which mean will be 0 and you will have 1 sigma, 2 sigma, 3 sigma is the minus 1 to sigma, 2 sigma, 3 sigma is the minimum and uh, plus 1 sigma, 2 sigma, 3 sigma is the maximum. So my apologies, this, this stats are minimal uh, when we get into the data science world. So we have to understand what a standard deviation is here. So and that is what it is, but it's simple. I mean, anyone should be able to learn if, if you are able to recollect your 10th max. So, so that's what it is. So this line, it does lots of things. It does the k-means clustering from where k value is equal to 2 and all the way up to k value is equal to 15. It retrieves the within sum of squares value and then it positions it uh, within those WSS. So you can see that if you are taking a small sample, it should happen. It happened. So now we are plotting the within sum of squares values because that's of importance for us today uh, outside all the other things. And then now this is a simple line which takes what should be the values and what are the things which you are going to plot. It talks about the type, right? And uh, this is what will come in your x-axis, which is the x-lab, and this is what will come in your y-axis, which will be your y-lab, right? So when I plot it, right, this is how you compute your sum of squares, uh, within sum of squares. You can see that it starts at 2, at 3, the elbow point actually reduces. Between 3 and 4, the delta is very less. So that's how you say that k is equal to 3 is one of the good things. Okay? So once we do this, right, we got the elbow plot, right? When you are saying how good these clusters are, right? So we can see that in on a distribution, right, we see that this is how the clusters are arranged, particularly for between some of the squares to total some of the squares. So actually, if I have to take between some of the squares, within some of the squares, and total some of the squares, that itself is a session. And that forms the basis for most of the inferences, right? So let's keep it simple. We are achieving 72% here, right? The higher the percentage value, better is the model, right? So k-means cluster with three is the best. So let's relate to the cluster assignment to individual characteristics like director, Facebook likes, and other things. When we perform these things, right, the cluster two has a maximum movie likes as well as the director likes. We can see that, right? So when we do for all the other attributes, right, this is what we are seeing. 
So cluster two has the maximum, and uh, when we do an aggregation there, right? If I want to know the profit values of the movies, then we have certain parameters we say, which says if you look for the centers, it will tell what will be the predicted values. So, and you see that cluster two has the maximum there. So that's how I decide. I'll go with the cluster two. It's making maximum profit and the maximum Facebook likes. That's all in this session on the k-means clustering. Uh, definitely you can find the positive comments from individuals and then you have a Edureka data science uh, course already. You can subscribe and you can learn. Thanks everyone for joining this session. It was my pleasure to explain you what data science and k-means clustering is. Hope you learn further with Edureka on uh, data science. Wish you all the best. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply to them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to our Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.